Great. Hello, everybody. Thanks to everyone who's joining us today. Um, I'm Sophie Wilson. I'm going to be your chair today. I'll tell you a little bit about myself in a minute. But first, I'll just tell you a little bit about today's event. So I'm pleased to welcome you to this event. Um, it's on state violence, the miners' strike and the war on the working class. It's an Arise online festival of Labour's left ideas. And it's supported by a number of groups, including the Labour Assembly Against Austerity and the Orgrave Truth and Justice Campaign. So like I said, I'm Sophie Wilson. I'm a councillor in Sheffield. And in 2019, I was the parliamentary candidate in Rother Valley. Um, I'm also part of the Orgrave Truth and Justice Campaign. And Orgrave is, is actually in the constituency I was standing in. Uh, it's actually, I can actually see it from my house right now. It's, it's it's on my doorstep. Um, I got involved in this campaign. Um, I've known about the, the battle that happened, well, the police riot that happened at Orgrieve all my life. Um, but I really got involved after noticing the long lasting effects that strike and that battle had had on my area and the working class people living here. So for me, that strike, uh, that state's actions of brutality against the working class was a catalyst for me, which led to the current situation we're in today with zero hours contracts, bad conditions, weakened trade unionism and a long lasting distrust of police. Then I wasn't even born when all grief happened, obviously, but we're still feeling the effects of it today. And that's why I think it's so important to revisit these events, campaign for justice for the whole of our class and educate others on this war that has been waged on the working class by the ruling elite, a war which is still ongoing. And that's why I think that's the only way we can move forward and make progress and analyse the current situation that we're in. And we're also going through a major crisis right now and we need to put forward ways to transform our economy and put people, health and planet first. Political education and knowing history is vital to achieving this. If we're going to make real change, we need to learn what obstacles are in our way. Um, Arise, the group of people that put this on, Arise is a celebration of our values of solidarity and unity and this event is timely as we look to learn from the lessons of our history for the massive struggles we have ahead. So just touching on the Orgrave of Truth and Justice campaign, um, if you do want to join us, we have a rally. We usually have the rally at Orgrave every year, but because of coronavirus, we've gone online. Uh, you can find all the information on our Facebook page, and it's due to happen this Saturday, this Saturday afternoon. I think it starts at 1pm, but please do check out the Facebook page for that. And due to amazing level of interest, as well as the Zoom seminar that we have going on today, uh, we're streaming live direct from the Arise YouTube page um, alongside the other various Facebook pages. And as the event goes on, please do post questions in the comment section um, and there's a Q&A section on Zoom as well. And then we'll be able to put some of those to our panel. And our speakers today are Chris Peace. Uh, she's also from the Old Grief Truth and Justice campaign. And in 2019, she was Labour's candidate in North East Derbyshire. Uh, so we were very close to each other. Then we have Russell Frazier uh, from the Haldane Society of Socialist Lawyers. And then finally, we have John Trickett, MP. So, um, yeah, Chris, do you want to, to kick off? Um, that's OK. Yes, thank you, uh, Sophie, and thanks to Arise for uh, hosting uh, what hopefully is going to be a good, good uh, meeting uh, this evening. So our campaign was established in uh, 2012, um, and we have a very clear aim, and that is to get a full inquiry into the policing at the Orgreave Coping Plant on the 18th of June 1984. Uh, we are absolutely clear that there was state interference in the policing of that day and indeed the whole of the miners' strike and that it was planned meticulously. Uh, but I think it's helpful to think, well, why, why did this happen in the first place? What were the aims of that Thatcher-led government? Well, for a start, they didn't believe in a state-planned and controlled economy. And instead, they wanted to advance their ideas of free markets, trickle-down economics, this mantra of anything publicly owned is bad and anything run privately is good. The whole idea of new liberalism were the plans of that 79 Tory government. Um, now, back in the 70s, while there, there was anti-trade union legislation, uh, nowhere to the extent that there is today. And back then, there was power in a union to the extent that we haven't got today. And the NUM, the National Union of Mine Workers, 
effectively brought down the Tory Heath government by the actions that they took supporting their members. So when 79, when Thatcher was elected, the government then didn't just want to curb uh, the unions, they wanted to destroy them. Um, and after the defeat of the Heath government, they basically drew up a plan to do exactly this, the Ridley plan. And it was explicit in how to deal with strike action, not just to destroy organized labor, but to break the will and wear down any trade union members um, and to do that through state intervention, through violent policing, through abuse of the criminal justice system, all of which would be and indeed was aided and abetted by the right wing broadcast and print media at the time. Now, there were many, many examples of violent policing during the strike. It wasn't just that one day, but the events of that day were unprecedented. And that day, uh, we say, was a fundamental turning point in, in British policing of lawful assembly and of protest. Um, now, the campaign has spoken to several Tory Home Secretaries. There's been quite a few uh, since 2010, uh, with the aim of getting our full public inquiry. We handed in a legal submission in 2015 to Theresa May, and that was following the findings of the Independent Police Complaints Commission, that whilst they weren't going to do anything as a body, they did see and find that excessive violence was used by the police, that there had been fabrication of evidence and alleged perjury on the part of officers at the 1985 trial. Uh, and it's important to remember that although 95 minors were charged, uh, nobody was found guilty. They were all acquitted after the prosecution case fell apart in court. So Amber Rudd came in after Theresa May and she decided no inquiry was needed. She said nobody died, there was no miscarriages of justice, it wasn't in the public interest and that the police have got nothing new to learn because policing has changed. Now I'm sure the other speakers uh, will, will, will pull that apart uh, but I just want to look at that last point in a little bit more detail and look at the policing, uh, what happened there. This is the, our police force that the government used. They used it uh, as, as, an, as a, an arm of the state uh, to get their political uh, beliefs through. So the policing at all green, I said, was unprecedented. It was militarized policing. And whilst we saw it there, uh, we have seen it since. So the use of riot police, this is both with long shields and short shields and with long batons and short batons. Um, the use of horses and dogs, if you imagine the miners were gathered into a field that day, um, they, were, they were in fact used what, what we can describe as being kettled. Um, and at the, when the time was right for the police, you will remember that the long shield police moved aside and the horses charged. They were followed by a squad of short shield police with the short round batons and short, uh, short shields and short batons that effectively came and, and, and used that force um, to uh, bring the miners uh, down. Um, we had that day mass arrests um, following by, as I've already said, no convictions. And this is something that we still see happening. Um, we also had overcharging, and this is something that happens. What I mean by that, is that the miners on the day were arrested for minor public uh, order offences, things like section five, um, section four threatening behaviour. But the, by the time they had landed in court, those charges had been upped and overcharged um, as riot and unlawful assembly. Um, the day was very different to result in this cattle in effect um, because instead of being stopped at the roadblocks, as per usual during the strike, you were effectively shepherded in and told where to go. Um, one thing that we still see, and this is why that reason by Amber Dud was so, um, Amber Rudd was so dud, the reason, um, was this idea um, that um, the police basically um, can... Um, the way that they record their evidence still is done badly. At all grief, we've got police officers who have told us how evidence was dictated to them. We've had police officers in trial giving evidence 
that what they were saying in their statement, actually there'd been some mistake because they'd never seen that particular defendant. And they are able from this, uh, basically there's, there's not the sufficient safeguards so that we can actually trust when mass uh, picket and mass protest is being policed, that those safeguards are there for the police to properly record their evidence. And we know about the close links between the police and the media. This feeding of misinformation, getting out a false narrative, and then that's repeated uh, by the BBC in the case of Orgreave in terms of the fact that they claimed initially that the miners were the ones who were violent and the police responded. They accepted years later that they had uh, reversed the footage. And the paper whose name I won't even mention uh, demonised the miners just as it demonises every group of people uh, that doesn't agree to the Murdoch uh, beliefs uh, today. We know there's huge mistrust of the police in our mining communities um, still and mistrust generally. Um, it's interesting that the new Chief Constable of South Yorkshire Police is saying there should be an inquiry into Orgreave. It's interesting that uh, police crime uh, commissioners are saying that there should be an inquiry into Orgreave, um, but the government are allowing it. There's a long and sorry list of policing since Orgreave uh, where we've seen the same tactics. The poll tax riots in 1990, G20 riots in 2010, resulting in the death of Ian Tomlinson, an innocent bystander who got trapped in the police kettle. The student demonstrations over tuition fees in 2010, um, the occupation of Fortnum and Mason in 2011, 150 arrests that day and 109 charges never even went to court and 19 convictions only out of the 41 who were prosecuted. Um, the July critical mass, some people might remember in 2012, 182 people arrested, nine charged and only four convicted. Um, the anti-EDL rally in 2013 in Tower Hamlets, um, and there was a dying demo, some people may remember, um, in Shepherd's Bush in 2015 in the Westgate Shopping Centre, 76 people arrested. How many convictions? Zero. Nobody even taken to court, all the charges were dropped. It was the case of the Rotherham 12 in 2015. This was where anti-fascists were arrested um, after three years of waiting uh, to know what, what would happen with their cases. All 12 were acquitted. Anti-fracking demonstrations at Preston New Road. The list goes on and on. Um, and obviously we've had the recent um, case of Black Lives uh, Matters demonstrations across the world. So to conclude, the lack of accountability over the political interference and the direction of policing at Albury are still having a cause and effect today. And they've created a sense of impunity in how protest is policed um, on the behalf of the police. And for us, for us, when the government uses the police as an arm of the state, as they did at Albury, without any accountability, what is next? The legacy of the strike that was predicted by Scargill in July 1984 when he said, if the miners lose, you all will suffer. Hasn't he been proved right? Um, just as he was proved right about the true intention of the Thatcher government to uh, sell off nationalised industries. Uh, we're still seeing the consequences of the strike in our workplaces. Um, Non-unionised workplaces, precarious low-paid work, and our public services that have been broken up and sold off underinvested in and unequipped to protect the most vulnerable and aren't we seeing that now under COVID. Um, we know for sure that we're stronger when we're united and that's the theme for our annual rally that Sophie mentioned. It's being live streamed on our Facebook page 1pm. All Grieve is just one of many working class injustices and we're going to be joined on the day uh, with speakers from the Hillsborough Justice Campaign, Justice for Grenfell, Shrewsbury 24, Blacklisting Support Group, Joint Enterprise Not Guilty by Association, Janet Alder, sister of Christopher Alder, um, unlawfully killed in police custody will be there, and others from the NUM and the campaign. 
So please join us. All these groups of people, they were there for us during the miners. Many groups of people who back in the 80s were victimized by the police were there for the miners. We will be there for you. United, we are stronger. Thank you, solidarity. Hi, thank you so much, Chris. Um, brilliant, as usual. Um, and yeah, I completely agree with everything you said. As someone who's grown up um, next to the old grief site, um, obviously, after it happened, um, you really can see the devastating effects of that strike and, and the, the, the downturn on the economy that's caused in, in that there isn't any industry for people leaving school now to go to. Um, it, it, it really is a dire situation. Um, and all, all of those other instances that you touched on, um, that, that really struck home with me because I've, I've heard of those and aware of them all um, individually, but to put them together and present them as a working class injustice, as you just did, um, shows why exactly we do need to fight for justice uh, for the miners and, and, and for every other working class injustice that have happened over the past few decades, because it will keep happening. You know, we've not seen the end of it. They seem to want to sweep it under the carpet um, and say, oh, you know, we've changed. Um, you know, it won't happen again. No, it absolutely will. Um, it, it's just a waiting game. Before I move on, um, I've just been told uh, there's over 250 of you watching from all over the country. Um, so that's really amazing. Thank you all for coming. We've got people from Wolverhampton, Liverpool, all over Yorkshire, South Yorkshire, even someone from Norway. Um, so that's brilliant. So thank you for all of you for joining us and showing such an interest in this. Um, so the next speaker is Russell Fraser, and he's from the Haldane Society of Socialist Lawyers. So take it away, Russell. Thanks, Sophie, and thanks, uh, Chris and others, for inviting me to speak tonight. I'm, <clears throat> I'm really glad to be here. And if you'll indulge me for a moment, I'm proud, even more proud, to say that many of my senior colleagues, who are all now famous and probably quite wealthy lawyers, I shouldn't say that, Mark George, Queen's Council, Michael Mansfield, Queen's Council, Gareth Pierce, and others, John Hendy, I think, all represented the miners in the aftermath of the Orgreave battle. And where Gareth Pierce indeed was one of the solicitors who was there when the trials collapsed, uh, which led to the entire expose, if you like, of what actually took place. Um, I will bore you for a second by being a bit of a lawyer and reading what the Inquiries Act 2005 actually requires for a minister to consider having an inquiry. And it says simply, a minister may cause an inquiry to be held under this act in relation to a case where it appears to him that particular events have caused or are capable of causing public concern, or there is a public concern that particular events may have occurred. And so when Amber Rudd said, when she denied the inquiry in 2016, that she had concluded that there was not a sufficient basis to instigate either a statutory inquiry or an independent review, because ultimately there were no deaths or wrongful convictions, what did she bother looking at the, any of the evidence for in the first place? Because she knew before she picked up any pieces of paper that no one had died and no one had been wrongly convicted. But that's not what the Act requires of her. It asks that she looks at what happened. And is there public concern about Orgreave? Well, we wouldn't be here tonight on a balmy summer's evening, certainly where I am, with 200 people talking about this, if there wasn't public concern about it. And there should be wider public concern, you might think, because as we've just said, and Sophie's just said, it will happen again. And that working class communities will be attacked, whether it's by the police, whether it's by media, whether it's by institutions, it does happen and it will happen again. So the threshold is not very high at all. The question is, how does one uh, engineer the political will? Because as Mike Mansfield is always fond of saying, that when things like the Hillsborough inquiries were eventually achieved, it wasn't because of lawyers, it wasn't forgive me, John, because of MPs either. It was because of grassroots movements and organizations like this Organization Justice Campaign, which will eventually, I hope, succeed in obtaining that inquiry. Because it seems quite extraordinary, doesn't it, that what Chris has just outlined, that on that day in June of 1984, that um, 
the police came very clearly with a plan about why that day was going to unfold and it was their intent to crush that particular picket and to stop any uh, coking plants from being uh, any of the lorries not getting through and so on. And it was clear that they wanted to, as some people have written, make up for other uh, times like Salt Lake many years before when they had not so succeeded. And to say a bit more about the evidence that was uh, brought out at the, the trial, the first trial which collapsed, when we talk about evidence being fabricated, we don't just mean that my, uh, individual officers made things up. One officer admitted that he had been asked to dictate witness statements to other officers. And that wasn't just a case of, again, strategically done here and there. Vast paragraphs across many forces, because remember, it wasn't just the South Yorkshire police who were involved. Vast numbers had very similar, if not identical passages in their witness statements. And so when they stood at trial and, and they went into the witness box and were asked about individual events and individual things that happened that day, they were very quickly found out because they weren't there or they didn't arrest a particular person. So they didn't know what happened. And as Chris said, when they initially uh, 95 minors were arrested, they were charged with very minor offences initially, or arrested for minor offences. But we get to trial and 71 people are trying are uh, being tried for riot. Why? Because at that time it carried a maximum sentence of life imprisonment. Today it only carries 10 years, only it carries 10 years, but nonetheless back then it was potentially life. Why did that happen? Well, we don't know, but it's, it's fair to say that one of the objectives, as Chris has said, would have been to intimidate and to discourage. And so had and that 71 minors gone to trial and ended up being convicted of riot, then ultimately that would have been a demoralizing event and which would have presumably have discouraged a great many more from being able to take part potentially, or at least that is the hope of those who bring these sorts of charges. And again, harking back to what Sophie's just said, when, we, when, we, when the authorities say, well, we've learned our lessons, it will never happen again, you only have to look at some of the rhetoric from the Metropolitan Police in the last few weeks about banning protests, about restricting the rights of people to assemble and to uh, collectively assert their rights and assert their causes in the public domain. Setting aside the fact that there's a public health emergency at present, it goes back to last summer because of what Extinction Rebellion was doing at the time. Now, it seems extraordinary that nearly 100 individual court cases could be dropped and not a single person in authority wanted to know why and were, was not upset or angry about the fact that these uh, prosecutions did not result in convictions. So we need to know why that never happened. Why, why was there no inquest or anyone asked about what went on and who ultimately ordered it all to happen? Because again, as I say, it is something which is very much rooted in the idea that by using and misusing the criminal justice system in this way, you will intimidate and discourage and demoralise working class communities from fighting back against injustice. Um, in 2012, as Chris has said, the South Yorkshire Police referred itself to the IPCC. And then you fast forward to the, to the the IPCC's decision not to investigate anything further. And again, the narrative, which many people uh, seize on, particularly on the right, particularly Tory MPs, is that, look, it was all a very long time ago. Don't worry about it. But what about the people who are still to this day affected by it? Lives that were devastated. People suffered horrendous injuries on that day. Um, and if you've watched the film, uh, The Battle for Orgreave, you can see much of it uh, unfolding there. And don't forget, the police had a great deal, I think, of footage recorded at the time because they continued to use it in the years after to try to uh, educate and to, to train other officers in this new method of public order policing. But none of this was public at the time. So the idea of being policed by consent completely goes out the window also because what was being done is, as Chris has said, effectively what we had was a private militia being used to crack down on minors legitimately 
seeking to assert their rights and to try to uh, further the, their industrial cause, which they were seeking to uh, further at the time. As I say, it, it, there is, it isn't a high hurdle. And what all I can say is, and lawyers, again, often get bogged down in uh, legalese and so on, but the way it seems to me of, of achieving this inquiry is for all of us to work with the Orbe Chiefs and Justice campaign, because as I say, it's the grassroots campaigns which prevail, which raise the um, awareness of such issues in the public consciousness and ultimately start to change the mood. I'm pleased that in 2017 and 2019, the Labour Party manifestos both uh, pledged to hold public inquiries, not just into Orgreave, of course, but into blacklisting too, uh, closely connected in, 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 in a number of ways. And the fact is, whether that will remain in the Labour Party manifesto going forward, uh, we have to hope that it will do, because various ministers um, already have spoken in the last few years in, in favour of this happening. But it really must happen. And the fact is, it probably will only happen if there is a Labour government as things stand, or at the time at which such public pressure can be brought to bear by highlighting the stories of individuals who were affected at the time, but also by working with other grassroots campaigns to ensure that the message is heard and it rings out that there must be a public inquiry. I hope that's enough. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs> Great, thank you so much, Russell. Yeah, um, again, um, just as interesting. Yeah, listening to all that detail um, that you've put forward there, it is really scary um, to realise how purposeful and how orchestrated this whole thing was. You know, it wasn't just a skirmish or a fight, as they'd have you believe. This was purposeful, and the effects of it were also purposeful. This is the situation that the ruling class wanted us to be in, um, but we're not having it. We, we will fight back. Um, and again, a final plug for the rally on Saturday. Please do join us um, if you do want to fight back with us. Um, and our final speaker for the night is John Trickett. Um, doesn't need much introduction. Um, yeah, take it away, John. Well, thank you, Sophie. It's great to be here with my comrades and colleagues and friends and so many people plugging in. It shows how important all of this still is to people. I mean, I was um, alive and active at the time of the strike. I was actually elected first in the middle of the strike in September. And I, I'm a plumber by trade. I spent quite a bit of it volunteering to fix miners plumbing and heating and so on, because they were having problems, couldn't afford to pay for it. I spent a bit of time doing that. I spent some time on picket lines. Uh, it's hard to describe what it was like to live in Yorkshire on the, uh, on the edge of the coal field. You couldn't go anywhere with your dad or your mates um, to work without being stopped on every street corner. It was, it was quite shocking. And now I represent mining communities and uh, I know many friends and, and colleagues I've got to know well who were at all grief or in the strike more generally. There's no question at all that that, that event was planned by people in Downing Street and close to Downing Street. This was a political uh, action designed exactly to do what has just been said to intimidate people. Um, it was cold blooded. Miners were driven into all grief from all over the coal field. Unusually, the police were letting people pass, providing they were on the way to all grief. And the plan, it was planned on eye. It's worth reading Seamus Milne's book and David Peace's book, 1984, which are very dramatic uh, descriptions of what happened during the strike. This is a politicization of the police. And I've met many police subsequently in the community I represent, who were embarrassed and ashamed about the way in which the police were politicized. And so there has to be an inquiry and uh, it, it needs to be done, if only to protect the idea uh, that policing should be done by consent and that it should be free from uh, direction by politicians in the way that it was. And I, no doubt at all, the reason why there hasn't been an inquiry is because everybody knows that what it will reveal, that this was a politically directed action out of Downing Street by a Tory prime minister who was determined to be, break the back of the Labour movement. Have no, there can be no doubt about that. 
Incidentally, uh, I've got friends of mine, comrades, miners who were there and elsewhere in the strike who were arrested. <clears throat> the charge sheets were fabricated. Often the same words and the same paragraphs, the same sentence order were used for uh, people who've been at different events. And what happened was they went to the magistrate's court. They were held over, bound over to keep the peace. And a condition of bail was that they didn't go on any further pickets. So they couldn't do any more picketing. The day after the strike ended, the charges were dropped. Or perhaps not the day after, but very, very quickly after the strike ended. How did that happen? Were the magistrates also drawn into this? It looks like the, the whole criminal justice system was drawn in. And it was to intimidate people, but also to pick off if you like the elite of the mining community and to stop them from picketing. And I know many of them who did uh, continue, even though it was a bail condition that they shouldn't and ended up in prison. So look, uh, these were shocking events and there has to be an inquiry. I wanted just to reflect uh, on the bigger picture for a second, if I might, I hope people will be patient with me because I represent the town of Featherston, a mining community as was, which was right at the center of the struggle. But I'm going back now into 1893, if you'll forgive me, Sophie, for a minute, to the uh, Featherstone events, because in 1893, the mining unions were becoming quite a power in the land, and indeed across the continent. And there was a big meeting of the mining unions right across Europe uh, in 1893, the beginning of the year there. They decided to fight back against the coal owners. And that had a big impact on the coal fields, except in Durham, who voted to stay at work. But in my patch and throughout Yorkshire, there was a massive strike and lockout because eventually the bosses locked them out. Now in Featherston, what happened was it was a fairly peaceful community and the pit had two heads, one in my village where I live now, Ackworth, and the other one in Featherston. And the, um, the, the mines were in, in private ownership at that stage. Let me just say that, I'll come to it in a second. It was a fairly peaceful strike, but it was rock solid uh, there were a few uh, black legs, uh, as they were called, the scabs, and the uh, manager of the pit was actively moving coal, slurry effectively, to where the owner of the mine in, had a, a factory in Bradford, and he was keeping the fuel going to keep the factory going during that time. And he was, so the, the mine manager was under instructions. Anyhow, look, we get into September 1893 of that year. The strike is solid, or the lockout, and um, there's a meeting in Wakefield, a few miles away from my constituency. It's a meeting, a meeting with Lord St. Oswald, who was a mine owner. It's with the manager of the pit in my village and in Featherston, the same pit. And um, it's, a manage, it's a meeting with the magistrate, who is also a mine owner. And the mine owners between them decide that that day they will send the troops to Featherston. It's actually the day of St. Ledger races at Doncaster. So the police were sent off to Doncaster to police the race, the races. And the troops were then brought to Featherston. And without going through all the details, uh, the riot act was read. Uh, and the troops lined up with bullets, which were so powerful, they could penetrate 36 inches into a beech tree. And though you're supposed to leave time between reading the riot act and then attacking the so-called rioters, no time was left. And they were then, they then shot, the soldiers were taught, instructed to shoot at the ground just in front of the mob, a huge gathering of women and men, people from all over the Yorkshire had come because they heard of the troop deployment led by a man ringing a bell. Uh, fires were lit all over the pits. People came from everywhere into Featherston that day. The point of firing at the ground just in front of the crowd was that then the bullets would ricochet and do the maximum damage to the, uh, to the people there manifesting peacefully. And it, so much, the, the bullets were so powerful, by the way, that a man a quarter of a mile away was hit by one of the bullets and seriously injured. A number of people fell down, two were dead. And... Um, you can see the details on a pamphlet, which I'm going to uh, give you the details of in a minute, which is worth reading. It's worth reading about. This is the last time troops were used on English soil to fire 
on civilians. Though there are regular uh, rumors, and I've met people, that troops were dressed in police uniform or grief to uh, take some of the actions there. I'm sure that there's some truth to it because I met too many people who told me. Now look, what I, why I tell that story is, first of all, this is a long process of using repressive apparatus to stop working class struggle because the cause of the strike of the lockout was that the mine owners wanted to do what they always do, to cut the wages of the miners by a quarter. And they were already starving. The crowd shouted, we'd rather be shot than hungered to death. And there were people starving, literally starving there. Now look, here's the consequence, because at that time, 1893, the Liberal Party uh, had working class affiliation and some of the unions were part of the Liberal Party. So you, it was a Liberal uh, MPs in some areas. The Liberals were in charge, the Home Secretary was Asquith and he authorized the use of troops uh, at the request or insistence of the mine owners, particularly Lord St. Oswald. And what happened, the Liberals were never forgiven by the working class in Yorkshire and elsewhere. Wherever Asquith went, he was called an assassin and a murder, Featherstone Asquith. Asquith. And then um, what happened, Keir Hardy turned up at Featherstone and other socialists and the Independent Labour Party and some of the socialists, Marxists and others. And it was the start of the working class saying, we want our own party. We're not going to be part of a party which embraces the interests of the capitalists and of the working class. And in the end, as we know, the Liberal Party collapsed. Now, here's a lesson which you might want to think about after this discussion. A party which attempts to represent working class interests or, or middle class interests at a time of struggle and at the same time represent the interests of big capital is doomed to failure. There's some thought to be put into that in just in uh, recent events. I'll just leave that thought with you. Thank you. Well, wow, yeah, thank you so much for all that, John, especially the, the closing remarks. You've definitely given us all something to think about um, as we go home and, and, and in the ways that we organise um, within the Labour Party and outside of it um, going forward. Um, and I didn't know all that, um, that the, the whole story that you uh, were just retelling us. So amazing. Thank you for that. It's always good to learn more. So now we're going to move on to the first round of questions. Um, again, big thank you to all of our panellists so far. Um, and thank you to everyone who's written in with questions, whether it was on Zoom or on YouTube. So for the first round, um, we've got a few here. So the first one is from Frida. And it reads, it seems to me that different aspects of the state the media, the police, the government all work to protect vested interests and don't respect democratic campaigns and decisions. This has also been shown in how Corbyn was systematically undermined. How can we counter this as a movement? And then linked to this, um, we've got a question from Rona. And it says... So I just can't quite read it now. Uh, it's around the theme of the strength of the unions today, today compared, compared to 1984 and how we rebuild union strength and other movements outside of parliament. So how can we rebuild? Um, and then the final one is from Mike Jackson, who many of you might know from LGSM. Um, and he said, what would policing look like if the police defended the citizens rather than the government slash state? And how do we get there? So I'll give you all two minutes to come in on that um, and answer whichever parts of that you think is relevant to yourself. Um, shall, we, we'll, shall we stay with the running order? Chris, do you want to go first and then we'll loop back round? Yes, thank you. That are really good questions, actually. Um, uh, Frida's question, uh, first of all, um, I mean, it's, it's, it always feels and it always has been a struggle Definitely. Um, and I think a lot of us are feeling that um, even more so now. Um, certainly, I know being, having been a candidate in the last election, as Sophie was, um, you know, we, uh, you know, it, it's absolutely devastating the, the communities 
Um, and they, they were both ex-mining communities, both communities that have been um, robbed of industry, not had investment put into them, um, and communities that really needed the radical um, transformation um, policies in the manifesto. Um, but they didn't vote for us. And it's very hard reconciling ourselves to that as a Labour Party if we are not having that um, connection. Um, but in terms of, you know, how when when you're campaigning for something and you're feeling you can't get anywhere and that, you know, you've got these big institutions against you, um, you've just got to pull back on, I think, about what you're fighting for. Um, when you hear stories of ex-miners telling you that they've listened um, and were listening at the time to people like Leon Britton saying that they should go down for the rest of their lives and they had to listen to that for a year before they went on trial. You know, the, the, what that did to them, the, the actual, you know, excessive physical injuries that people are still coping with, the emotional injuries, the knowledge that we have got papers, policing papers that are embargoed from being published until 2066. If we don't keep going on fighting now, you know, then, you know, people are going to be, be, be long and gone. We have lost so many ex-miners and their families who have died not seeing justice uh, for what happened to them. So, you know, you've got to keep the campaign going. We've got to keep the pressure on. We've got to remember and remind people that, you know, whoever is attacked, it could be you next. One of the quotes that has been used an awful lot recently is one of the quotes we need to keep reminding people um, you know, when groups are attacked, you could be next. And the quote, I'm going to mention, you all know it, but it's the Angela Davis one. If they come for me in the morning, they will come for you in the night. Now, that is what has got to keep us going, uh, because, you know, the attack is, is bigger than one group of people, and we need to stand together on it. It's hard, but we must do it. Great. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Russell? I'll, I'll talk about, uh, I'll, I'll address Mike's question, I think, about um, what, should, what should policing look like effectively. Um, it, we might be about to find out in Minnesota, I'm not sure. It seems that they've voted to uh, the town, whatever, whatever the administrative body is, voted to defund the police as, as a slogan, which is uh, taking hold in America says. But I think the starting point, could be that very case itself, because why did it require four police officers to come to a corner shop uh, when there was a report that a man had passed a counterfeit $20 note? It doesn't require armed police to turn up to investigate what's going on there. So th there must be other ways that we can envisage about how policing uh, can take place in communities where it is more about the integration of police officers in communities to help people with mental health problems, with drug addiction, with uh, issues related to, to poverty, frankly, rather than having simply these um, uniformed uh, men, predominantly women, who come in and maybe only you only see them when there is something that's going wrong and they don't take any time to understand. There are officers like that out there. I mean, I, I come across them often in my job. They're not all uh, seeking to sort of turn up with, and pull out um, their asp as soon as possible and start hitting people. So it's about, I think, someone, or whether it's uh, politicians again, whether it's movements that can, can actually provide that alternative vision about what policing should actually be about. Because I think a lot of the general public still want there to be officers who will come with a gun or with a taser as and when necessary, when someone's life is at risk or where serious disorder is about to take place, perhaps. But many times that's not what's required. More often than not, that's not what's required when there's a report of a disturbance. So it's about trying to create that alternative vision about um, how policing for the people would take place rather than policing simply uh, as, a, as, a, as an extension of the state and its monopoly on violence. Right, thank you for that, Russell. 
Um, yeah, if, if no one minds, I'm just going to chip in myself about this one, um, about how we can move forward. I've spoken on a few other um, events about community organising. Um, I'm sure we can link you to some brilliant Tribune articles um, and other events on that. I do think that's a brilliant way to move forward and, and be able to convince the communities that Chris was saying, you know, didn't vote for us. And that's really hard to reconcile with. Um, and, and it's because we're not there. We're not really not as present as we used to be. You know, the, the miners' welfares have been shut. Um, we, we often don't have a way to engage um, non-policing. So um, I'm involved with a community union called ACORN. And um, they're absolutely brilliant. Please do go and check us out. Um, and a lot of what we centre around is tenants' rights because that's just what our members said to us um, was, was a big problem and um, bad landlords. Um, and we stop um, illegal evictions. And at the weekend, we was protesting outside a landlord's house. It was in a very posh area of Sheffield and he's renting out basically slumps um, to those who have lost a lot of income due to COVID. Um, he was trying to blackmail them um, with... Um, with eviction if they didn't pay more money basically because he knew that they couldn't move so we, we staged a peaceful protest outside of his house he phoned the police and five massive police cars turned up you know within 15 minutes um, you know and you've got to ask yourself what what were they protecting? They were protecting the capital um, of this man. And once they got there, they found out actually that there wasn't really a disturbance and there wasn't much we could do. But from my point of view, that is certainly not what I want to see um, from the police. Um, and I'd be interested in, in what Mike was thinking about when he asked that question. But finally, do you want to go to John um, to, to sum up um, the final points on those three questions? Okay, well... I think, you know, whenever we have these discussions, people say how we're going to overcome uh, the force of the right wing media and, um, you know, the general right wing trend in society. And of course, it's difficult. And um, one of the one of the things I think is to insist on the inquiry, because demanding an inquiry and the Tories refusing to have them raises the question, well, why don't they want an inquiry? What have they got to hide? And it allows us then to raise some of the issues which have been raised tonight. Uh, but community organizing, I think, uh, is important. Uh, socialists in previous generations, the pioneers, the giants whose shoulders we stand on, knew how to organize. They knew how to organize. Let me tell you a story of the first Labour MP in my patch. Very, I'll try to be quick. It's a good story, though, so hopefully you'll stick with us. A bloke comes to see me at one of my surgeries, an old man. He says, uh, he says, oh, he says, uh, my uncle will one of you. I said, I don't know what you mean, one of me. He said, well, he worked first Labour MP for Hemsworth. I said, oh, that's fascinating. He said, yeah, he's in a little Mark Grave. Anyway, it turned out he was. And elected in 1918, a minor, uh, out of the pit, elected to go to Parliament. No buses, no trains, no car, no money. Working class people couldn't afford to get there. As far as I could see, he didn't go very often at all, actually. And he died eventually in poverty and was buried in an unmarked grave. Anyway, it's a story which I'll tell on another occasion. We managed to get a headstone for him. I'll tell that on another occasion, but I want to tell this story. Because one day, the miners come to see him. There's a fire down at pit. And uh, call him John Guest, John, what we're going to do. So he goes to see the manager and he says, look, there's nothing we can do. There's six men on the other side of the fire. They'll have to die because we can't break through. So this MP, who I don't think ever spoke in Parliament, put on his working clothes, got seven or eight men to volunteer, go down the pit, break through the fire and rescue the men, bring them to the surface. And these are the values of solidarity and looking after each other that our movement ought to be and needs to be built and certainly was built on in those days. And I call them the giants of the giants whose shoulders we stand on. I think my feeling about the labor movement is some people think it's a career ladder to climb up. Others understand it's a movement to change the way we organize a society so that the values of greed and uh, the law of the jungle of get rich quick are to be rejected in favor of society whose values are based on cooperation and looking after each other. I've got your back if you've got mine. And I think we've got to 
get back to telling stories, to understanding that uh, however fancy our ideas are, if we can't speak in a vocabulary of ordinary people, if we sound like we've been to Oxford University seminars and we've never learned any other way of talking, if we dress and we have accident, accents that don't work, and we can't speak, like I've just told you a story, in ways that people can relate. And if we can't organize in a horizontal way, instead of a vertical top-down way, then we're not gonna break through. And I think we need to look back to the way that the pioneers built our movement, the sacrifices that they gave, and the movement which they created, which we should be proud to be part of and never forget. Well done. Again, thank you so much for that, John. Um, very interesting, as usual. Right, we've got a few more questions. Um, these are a little bit more specific. Uh, we'll try and keep it quick because we are going to try and wrap up um, on the hour, if that's okay. So these are a little bit more specific. First one, uh, maybe Chris, you'll be able to answer, but we'll go around everybody. Um, what is the current Labour leadership's position on an inquiry? Um, on no, second one is for you, Chris. Maybe John, you can ask. The, you can answer this one. What is the current Labour leadership's position on an inquiry on Orgreave? And then from someone else, this is how close are the people who got injured at Orgreave to getting a settlement? And then the final question is, do the panel see parallels between the global violence and repression against the Black Lives Matter movement and the historical cases of anti-working class state violence? Uh, the, that's the, the incidents that Chris and others have referred to. So, yes, yeah, should we start with Chris and we'll go around. So it's about the, the Labour leadership's current position on an inquiry. How close are those affected? Um, how close are they to getting a settlement and the parallels between the Black Lives Matter movement and the historical cases of working class, anti-working class violence? Um, yeah, thanks, Sophie. Um, again, um, you know, we have to just put all of this into context, I think. In 1984, we cannot deny that the Labour Party let the miners down. They didn't support the strike. The Labour leadership in 1984 was not supportive of the strike. Um, in subsequent years, we had a Labour government that didn't do anything, didn't order an inquiry into all group, didn't look at it. Um, and as a campaign, we didn't start, in fairness, until 2012. Um, and we did get, get some support, but we were having to kind of some Labour MPs were interested in speaking to us. Others have been solid from the start um, and, you know, be very clear about that. But it wasn't until we had the change in leadership. Um, when Jeremy became leader, that we became Labour Party Pont Manifesto. And anybody who was at Labour Party conference in 2016, 2017, 18 and 19 will have witnessed uh, Diane Abbott getting a standing ovation every time she reiterated that all grieve uh, was, it was Labour Party policy in the manifestos of 17 and 19 to have a public inquiry. Um, so is it still there? Um, I think, you know, it should be there. Um, there. Certainly that's what we're saying. You know, there shouldn't be any change. The support we had from Diane Abbott as Home Secretary was amazing. She met with the miners themselves. She spoke with their families. She completely got it. Um, and, you know, we are, we are policy at the moment. Uh, long may that be. Uh, but when you have a conference hall in four successive years giving a Home Secretary a standing ovation for that policy, I think it'd be a pretty stupid thing to change it. Yeah, completely agree, Chris. Right, Russell? Um, I don't know whether the, someone asked about compensation being paid. I, I, Chris might know the answer. I think some some miners in 84 definitely got compensation for being uh, wrongly arrested and prosecuted, but I don't know about anything to do with injury pegs. Maybe come back to Chris, but are there parallels historically with other movements? I think I've probably wrongly summed up that question, but I'll, I'll, I'll turn it into something I think I can answer. Um, well, of course, yeah. I mean, two, two weeks ago, we saw a horse charging down Whitehall and 200 years ago, horses at Peterloo were charging around, um, attacking um, working class people who were coming together again to 
uh, try and further their position in, in, in society. You know, for the Black Panthers in the 60s, Fred, Fred Hampton's a great hero of mine. He said, we say you don't fight capitalism with black capitalism, you fight capitalism with socialism. And that's uh, a message that, again, we're hearing more of again in the last few years, certainly on the Labour left, uh, and, and the fact that we're not afraid to say that anymore. So I think that there are parallels insofar as um, people, are, it has its own characteristics at the same time, because it's arisen from a particular type of treatment, which despite all the protests and so on, it continues to happen and continues to happen that people are being killed in broad daylight uh, simply because of who they are. Whereas in perhaps historically things have taken different and more often more subtle uh, manifestations. But I, at the end of the day, it's about the solidarity in those communities working together to counteract that particular attack on their identity or indeed on their on their class, basically. And so it, it probably will recur and will recur in years to come. And there, there certainly are parallels as far as I can tell. But perhaps this time around, hopefully, we've seen uh, support for what happened in the States across the world in a way that maybe we haven't seen when similar incidents have happened in the past. Why that is, maybe others can, can speak to that better than I can, but yeah, undoubtedly there are parallels. Thank you for that, Russell. Um, and just finally, before I ask John to um, answer and then uh, sum up for us, because he'll be the, the final speaker tonight. Chris, uh, you wanted to, to come back on the compensation issue, didn't you? You, you just muted. Yes, uh, apolo apologies for that. Um, yes, there, there were civil uh, cases that, that were settled. Um, and I think that's very important. So, so some of the miners actually um, questioned the lawfulness of their arrest, um, questioned the use of excessive violence, um, but these were done under um, civil um, headings. So um, a very uh, different area to the world of criminal justice um, and an area where you can get a settlement without having um, any acceptance of any wrongdoing. And that's a path um, that South Yorkshire Police went down. And that's the path that those miners chose who did pursue those claims to, to accept. Um, but this was all done uh, without, um, on, a, on a without prejudice basis and without the police uh, for South Yorkshire Police accepting uh, any responsibility on their part for the organisation, which is a key aspect of um, the All Group campaign. Obviously, it doesn't even touch on the state interference. Um, and it was all done without accepting any guilt, if you want to use that phrase. So there were some compensation settled. However, that doesn't bring any of it to, to an end. Um, and the other thing I'd just like to very, very briefly say, um, just when I answered before about the, uh, the fact that we had a Labour Party that, you know, didn't do anything. I want to reiterate that there were some left MPs at the time, um, immediately after the strike, who did actually call for an inquiry. Um, and they were the MPs on the left of the party. And sadly, their favour and their calls didn't win through their leadership then. Um, but certainly there, there have been some great comrades in the Labour Party back um, at the time of the strike and immediately after it. So thank you. Right, thank, thank you for that, Chris. Um, and John, do you want to sum up for us um, of any closing remarks or, or, or final yeah. answers to the questions that we've had? Okay, well, well, I think it's been a really good session. I think the fight for justice uh, will never end. Uh, we have to have this. There was an inquiry, by the way, I mentioned, didn't mention it, um, into the Featherson massacre and that's how we know so much about it, parliamentary inquiry, they had to give in. So the movement then was maybe stronger than it is now because we haven't yet succeeded in getting uh, that inquiry. But uh, look, I think we all know what happened, but it needs to be put on the record formally. And that is why an inquiry is a central question of settling this for all. It also ought to protect decent, honest police officers who want to uh, uh, police on the basis of consent and not be used by politicians. But amongst the senior ranks of the, of the police force, uh, there's a, it's a different matter. They had a, an opportunity, it seemed to me, to say no to Mrs Thatcher, this is not how policing is done in our country. 
but instead they allowed themselves to be used and were willing participants. So that, I think that has to be settled. I don't think we've said enough probably about Hillsborough, the same police officers, the same police force, using the same techniques uh, in the miners' strike in, uh, as, in, as in Hillsborough. So we know what was going on there. So uh, my final point is this really, uh, the fight for justice, I've just said, never ends. We have to keep on fighting and believe that we will get there. The Labour Party is quite clear that is our policy. And I will be interested to see when the Labour, new Labour leadership gets around to endorsing our policies, our policy. And I think just maybe three things quickly to uh, the Labour Party is the party which was created by the trade unions and the working class generally. I spent 51 years fighting for the left inside the party. I was elected in the middle of the miners strike and it was difficult to be a Labour Party candidate. So it's not, it's not unusual for Labour Party candidates to find difficulty in working class community. I can tell you that, but we won that by election in September that year. And I think three things really. One, community organising is part of the future than what I described. Secondly, more working class candidates getting into parliament. Not that I'm against people from professional backgrounds and university degrees and all the rest of it, but we need more ordinary folk, people who are carers, people who, you know, from all the different kinds of backgrounds we need him. And finally, a Labour Party which stands on principle, the principle of socialist transformation of our society, of defending working class interests and promoting them wherever they are. So at the end of a Labour government, we can see real progress. We don't have people saying, oh, I'm fed up with this lot, let's change it. We have a community which understands that there was a government there which stood by them through difficult times as well as good times and began to transform our society away from the horrors which we've seen in the last few years and which the miners experienced over all those decades. Thanks very much to everybody for listening and thanks, Sophie, to you for sharing it tonight. Thank you. Brilliant, brilliant way to sum up. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, absolutely agree. The Labour Party, everybody needs to know that we are run by the working class and we are for the working class always, um, no matter what obstacles get put in our way. Um, so I just want to say thank you, everybody who's joined us tonight. Um, at one point, we had over 300 of you watching. Uh, that's absolutely amazing. I'm so glad so many of you are, are interested in everything that, that myself and all the panellists had to say tonight. Um, we know you all have important battles ahead um, and also just how important campaigning, being out campaigning is for people um, and how essential events like this are in terms of socialist political ed education. So I just want to say thank you to the people at Arise for putting this on. Um, this is absolutely the things that we should be doing in lockdown. Um, I've attended quite a few of these events myself um, and I've learned so much. Um, it's really great to be able to, to learn like this without actually having to, to leave home. And I actually hope to carry on even when lockdown is, is, is lifted. And on that, um, we need to keep working together to insist that there is no return to business as usual when it comes to our economy and politics. And we need to argue that a better world is possible and not only argue it, but we need to win that better world. Um, and I just want everyone to note that the next Arise event is at 7 p.m. this Wednesday, the June the 17th, um, and it's on lessons from a pandemic, why NHS privatisation, underfunding and staff shortages must end. And on that call, we've got Dr. Sonia Adesara from Keeper NHS Public, uh, Laura Smith, uh, she's currently a crew councillor and she's a former MP and Lara McNeil, she's the Labour NEC youth rep and I believe she's just qualified as a young doctor as well. And John Lister from the Health Campaigns Together. So that look, looks like it'll be a really interesting event. That's uh, next Wednesday, June that's this Wednesday, June, June the 17th. Sorry, yeah, because of lockdown, um, days of the week just, just mean absolutely nothing to me these days. Uh, so yeah, that this Wednesday. And remember this Saturday, we've got the Orgreave Truth and Justice Rally. So please join us for that. So we'll end there. And again, thank you everybody for joining us.